Okay, I think we're set. Should I start? Yep, we're set. Hello, um, I'm welcoming you to a very interesting uh, webinar on an important and interesting topic, um, basic research on the impact of dietary sugar on cancer by Dr. Paying Young. Uh, Dr. Young um, is an assistant professor at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, she serves on the board of the cancer of, of the Society of Integrative Oncology. Um, give me one second. I just lost her bio all of a sudden. Paying is very interested in um, research on nutrition. She received her undergraduate degree and master's degree in pharmacy from the Beijing University of Traditional Chinese Medicine, following study in pharma pharmaceutical science at the University of Kentucky in the College of Pharmacy. She completed her do doctor degree in nutritional science from the University of Maine. Over the past several years, Dr. Yang has been engaged in translational research on traditional Chinese medicine, natural products, and bioactive lipids in cancer treatment and prevention through both preclinical and clinical evaluations. Additionally, more recently, her laboratory has been engaged in understanding the molecular mechanisms of added sugar in breast tumorigenesis. Several, several of her studies on natural products and cancer treatment and prevention have been funded by NIH or NCI as R01 or R21 mechanisms, including an R01 grant proposal on the chemopreventative effects of fish oil on lung or colon cancer funded by the NCI. She also serves as a key co-investigator in NCI-funded grant studying the role of traditional Chinese medicine in cancer treatment and symptom management. She's published more than 95 peer-reviewed papers and currently serves as a board member at the Society of Integrative Oncology, a member of the Executive Committee of SIO, and a member of the American Botanical Council, as well as an associate editor for the Journal of Integrative Cancer Therapies. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Yang now. So I already, uh, I already accepted. Um, should I go on? Yep. You're not at the beginning of your slideshow, though. Oh, that's another thing again. Why? OK, hold on, hold on. That's OK. I saw that I changed it. There we go. Okay, so now it's the first slide. You're set. Okay. All right, thanks, uh, Santos, for um, the introduction. Um, and then some people are interested in attending the, uh, the webinar. Um, so what I'm going to share with you in the next uh, um, probably 45 minutes uh, about what I have done in the last few years about the uh, sugar and the um, breast cancer development and progression. So I will started with some kind of uh, background information, then I'll get into my uh, research in the preclinical uh, studies on sugar. So I have nothing to uh, uh, disclose in terms of specific for this study, related to this study. Um, so, you know, we, we all know, uh, hear this a long time, a lot of time about the news about sugar, and, and uh, I think we all concerned about sugar, and that's why I, that we're interested. But the, uh, really, the impact of sugar on the non-communicable disease, including diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, has been studied since actually 1980s. In fact, the recently um, uh, a movie come out, a new movie called uh, Sugar Coated. If you're interested, you can go to uh, actually Netflix does have that movie. I'll actually talk about the history of the sugar um, industry, all the studies, and so on and so forth. But most of those sugar studies were centered around their effect on, on uh, obesity and diabetes. Um, 
the, the really uh, up to 2012, there was uh, news come out uh, um, um, about the sugar considered uh, toxic when the preceding journal Nature actually published a commentary paper titled The, uh, the Toxic Truth About Sugar led by Dr. Robert Lustig at UCSF. And then um, the similar research group actually published another study um, that showed that just restricting sugar and fructose intake to 10 and 5 percent of their calories for nine days in the uh, children with obesity metabolic syndrome, um, they can significantly improve the biomarker associated with um, metabolic syndrome uh, or, uh, um, in those children, which was um, basically highlighted by the Time magazine at that time. So, is sugar really bad? I mean, we all know sugar is naturally curved, but the problem is the amount of sugar we consume these days. Now, in the U.S., the average consumption uh, um, of sugar is really between 70 to 100 pounds per person per year, depends on where the survey comes from. And then uh, worldwide, the, um, the consumption of sugar was tripled over the last uh, uh, 50 years. So it's really the amount of sugar, I think, caused more problem than really sugar itself. So there are a lot of um, studies have been shown, uh, you know, epidemiology studies uh, look at a lot of glycemic load or glycemic index, which represent how quickly the glucose level increase in the plasma um, when, you, um, when people digested those uh, food. Um, but uh, the, one of the studies specifically showed in the um, uh, lead by uh, Dr. Ford in uh, NCI that um, the high globe the food with high glycemic load and fructose actually increased pancreatic risk um, among the women, particularly they were uh, more um, significant in the people who have overweight and, uh, and, and uh, um, physically not active. Um, then the other study published in uh, 2012, uh, like 10 years later, shows the, um, the, the, uh, the food, the excess um, intake of added sugar and dietary glycemic or food with high glycemic load and glycemic index are associated with increased risk of colon cancer. Um, that independently, the most the interesting study from that study was they say that independently from the effect on uh, obesity and diabetes, which was uh, slightly different from what they see in the pancreatic cancer. So um, additionally, there are more study in the um, uh, breast cancer. So they, this was study sort of like a meta-analysis uh, to looking at different study published from 2003 to 2011 um, to talk anything with showing glycemic load and breast cancer risk. As you can see here, all of this um, study published, conducted in different country. In, um, in U.S., of course, five of them, and then there are Canada, Europe, Italy, Sweden, Mexico, and, and China. Overall, you can see the, high, the food with high glycemic index uh, load was showing increase of the breast cancer or, or tendency to increase breast cancer. Now, I want to point it out here. There's a one seems showing they're actually reduced, but this is only in premenopause women. But in postmenopause women, actually increase. Uh, their hazard ratio is 1.87. So that's suggesting there is probably some link between the high, the glucose in the diet and and uh, uh, or the sugar in the diet uh, associated with the increase of uh, breast cancer, and particularly the in 2009, this is a control, case control uh, study shows that um, the consumption of food uh, grouping that include uh, dessert food, sweet beverage, added sugar was actually positively associated with breast cancer risk. Um, so all this together, we can see there's from the epidemiology studies um, that or population studies, definitely there's a suggestion that high sugar diet actually could possibly associate with number of uh, cancers, uh, including breast, um, pancreatic colon. And actually, early this year, they, um, they, in the experimental biology meeting, they were just reported that um, the high fructose uh, intake actually associated with the risk of prostate cancer. Now, th this, with that said, the preclinical study comparatively is actually much less. Um, 
there's uh, only a few study has been published. One of this was uh, in 2010 uh, by Japanese group led by uh, Dr. Sakamoto. That um, they they what they did they used the uh, um, a carcinogen induced uh, pancreatic carcin carcinogenesis model in hamster and give them a high sucrose diet and to see what the development of the uh, pancreatic regions. Um, as you can see here, definitely with the, uh, what is the 10 eyes and 50 eyes mean here is the 10 eyes, the 100 eyes, so the 100 eyes actually have 500 grams of sucrose and 50 eyes means that in the diet they have 385 grams of sucrose. So this Two groups together, they have shown increased almost twofold of the um, the uh, pancreatic uh, cancer and fivefold in the carcinoma. Most in uh, interesting thing is that they didn't seem to show in the the sucrose group actually uh, diet in increased the body weight of the hamster. Now the other study published in uh, two thousand. Nine that also uh, 2013. This was uh, studied in the high sucrose diet in the uh, uh, colon cancer development um, using the APC mean mouse. APC is a major, uh, is a mutant, uh, highly mutant uh, genes in the colon cancer. So in this study, they also showed in the mice with uh, was on sucrose diet has a higher level of the uh, the adenomas uh, numbers and then the, uh, the prevalence, both in small intestine and colon. Um, I also want to point it out, the studies was also used very high sucrose level, that's around 500, again, which is actually almost three times more than the um, average American uh, consumption, like a uh, year or uh, um, uh, daily or yearly. So, so with that, we can see there is a um, very prom sort of promising data to show this is um, there is a strong epidemiology studies basically suggesting there sugar could potentially associate with increase of various cancers as I uh, alluded earlier and then the very few preclinical study also demonstrated sucrose enriched diet probably should could stimulate uh, tumor development in, in different type of animal models now there's a gap here so what we don't understand or, or don't know, first of all, that most of the preclinical study has been done, as I alluded earlier, use a dose that very high compared to the average American consumption. So, so then make those study very difficult to translate to actually um, in, the, in, the real, um, in the real life. And then the other thing is there's really not a lot of molecular mechanism hasn't been, have been identified on how sugar affect tumor development progression of, uh, of cancer, especially for breast cancer. But uh, most study was uh, centralized uh, with, uh, um, with the uh, um, insulin, you know, glucose insulin pathways. But um, actually, the two study was reported earlier, I, I, the pancreatic and colon, none of them seen any change in insulin what they, they give sucrose. So that suggests there's something else actually could attribute to this uh, the effect sugar on the development progression of cancer. So um, why are we specifically interested in uh, breast cancer? So the, the estimate cost of breast cancer care in the United States actually each year is over $16 billion and more than any other cancers. And the other thing is you, I have showed earlier, the study has shown that there's an the human study worldwide shows that dietary carbohydrate actually with high glycemic index or glycemic load has significant impact on development of breast cancer. And, and uh, there's a couple of studies just published recently with ID sugar uh, was done in uh, Malaysia also showed that ID sugar was uh, increased um, the risk of breast cancer. Um, thirdly, the U.S. adult women actually are currently consuming nearly three times the recommended limit. So the uh, the word um, the American Heart Association has the recommendation of sugar intake for women is six teaspoons per day, but right now the average consumption of the uh, sucre, I mean the added sugar in U.S. adult women is about 14 to 16 teaspoons per day. So you can see there's a sort of high. The other thing is there's really hasn't um, 
have any uh, preclinical study showing whether the the um, uh, sugar or dietary uh, sucrose could have an impact in breast cancer in the preclinical uh, settings. That's why we got uh, excited and interested to study this uh, about three years ago. So with that, we actually had four objectives in our study. First of all, we want to determine the effect of sucrose in rich diet in um, breast tumor genesis using different uh, breast uh, tumor models, both human mouse. We want to identify the biotic components um, of sucrose that are responsible for sucrose-induced breast tumor genesis because sucrose have, it's a disaccharide um, composed by, of uh, glucose and fructose, and then those will be uh, released once they digested to become a monosaccharide. But we don't know which one really uh, actually responsible for sucrose effect. And then we want to identify the molecular target that play a role in sucrose in each diet, induce uh, breast tumor genesis. And finally, uh, we also want to understand whether glucose could have any impact in chemotherapy uh, uh, agency um, when they treat it in the breast cancer patient or, or breast cancer cells. So uh, I will, well, we started to um, really conduct some studies to answer the first two, uh, two uh, questions or objectives um, to really uh, determine the impact increased sucrose consumption on cell development tumor. We start uh, choose to use the HER2 transgenic mouse. Uh, we basically um, um, randomized the five weeks old HER2 transgenic mice to uh, isochloric control diet, which is the, the carbohydrates pure corn starch, and then the sucrose enriched diet, um, and then monitor them uh, the time to appearance of tumor and tumor growth rate. Um, so as you can see here, at six months of age, 30% of the mice on the control diet had measurable tumor, and then uh, whereas uh, 50 and 58% uh, of mice on the sucrose enriched diet uh, develop memory tumors. Um, and additionally, you can see the tumor weight was also increased um, along the uh, treatment, the, the, the mice on the uh, sucrose uh, diet compared to the cornstarch diet. Um, furthermore, um, the sucrose fed uh, mice that uh, with 125 gram per kilogram um, dose that had significantly poor survival compared to the cornstarch um, uh, uh, diet mice. And then we also did a histological uh, examination, uh, look at the memory gland in the control, um, in the control and, tr and sucrose fed uh, mice, sucrose diet fed mice. The control, you can see this is a regular uh, memory duct. And then the, we also see in the control, there is a, a hyperplasia region in the memory gland already, but there's no adenoma. But in the uh, 500 gram, uh, kilogram sucrose diet group actually shows the um, adenoma already. And then what's also uh, interesting to us is that we look at the weight of all these mice, um, there seems not really substantial change in their uh, body weight over actually seven months of period when they were uh, on the study. Um, so that was uh, sort of consistent to, you know, with what they have shown previously. And then, um, so this data basically suggests that tumor promoting uh, sucrose might not be or independent uh, from obesity uh, or, or, or diabetes because we also look at the insulin level, we didn't see any change. And then, um, to confirm whether promoting five sucrose in breast cancer can be observed in other BC model, we actually examine the effect of the uh, sucrose in rich diet on the growth of primary tumor metastatic potential. And using the other two models, one is uh, uh, 41 mouse memory gland tumor and then the MD231 human tumors. In the, um, the mouse 41 memory gland uh, carcinoma model, um, both uh, primary tumor and then the lung metastatic uh, nodules was in, with, uh, uh, increased um, in the sucrose uh, fat mice, sucrose diet fat mice. Um, then particularly at 250 gram per kilogram, they, this effect was actually significant compared to the cornstarch. Um, and then we, um, 
look at the um, the lung metastasis using the uh, the histopathology approach. This is basically showing there is a much less lung nodules compared to the sucrose uh, um, diet group. And this is actually the lung after six of it formula. You can see there are small nodules in the control. There's a more nodule in the sucrose, and there are bigger nodules as well. And then uh, similarly, um, uh, the um, sucrose diet also increased the tumor growth, primary tumor growth of the MBA 231 model in the, uh, the um, mouse uh, autotopic uh, uh, setting. Again, in this study, we didn't see um, body weight will change, although this, this uh, study was in a short period of time. It was uh, only um, the 41 was three weeks, and then the five weeks. But there's no significant change on body weight. Uh, so together, this really the three set of experiments we, we basically demonstrating that um, a sucrose enriched diet not only shortened the onset of primary tumor and increased proliferation in the memory gland tumor, also they really notably, notably increased lung metastasis potential of 41 mouse um, memory carcinoma. So then um, the further dissect which component in the sucrose diet is actually altering breast cancer growth and metastasis, we uh, decided to feed the mice with uh, different component diet of the sucrose, which are the glucose and, and fructose. And then we also added a diet of glucose and plus fructose, which is uh, at the same level uh, ratio of the sucrose. So as you can see here, um, the, similar to sucrose diet, anything with fructose in it, so the fructose, sucrose, and then fructose plus glucose, they have showing the uh, uh, larger tumors compared to the control and the glucose group. This is about uh, tumor volume over time, and this is a, when we uh, terminate study the tumor weight. Um, what mo also also very interesting here, you can see the lung metastasis was correlating to the memory gland tumor growth in the, uh, the sucrose group, fructose and fructoplast sucrose group, all significantly have higher uh, lung nodules compared to the, uh, the sucrose, uh, the, the cornstarch control. Um, what is uh, interesting to us in this particular study, we actually measured the fasting glucose level. We see the, the, the glucose level was also higher in those uh, diet with the fructose in it. So um, this together suggesting or indicate that fructose from the diet is actually most likely responsible for facilitating the breast cancer tumor development and metastasis. So now it's, it's sort of clear, um, we, we, we got this um, sort of data showing this is um, the, the sucrose enriched diet probably um, um, has ability to increase uh, breast tumor um, genesis, both by um, development and then the progression. Um, but so what is the mechanism? Um, so what we did to, 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 in order to elude the mechanism, what we did first, we actually um, performed the reverse pro phase proteomic array um, to on the memory gland tumor tissues and collected from the HER2 mice, because that was the first study we conducted. As you can see, this is uh, the, the, the total of about 125 uh, protein was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, measured. And then you see the groups of the uh, protein was uh, monitor, modul modulated by a different group of uh, uh, sugar, I mean, um, uh, sucrose diet. And then when we look at uh, details, and we found a group of uh, um, protein actually elevated by the, uh, the sucrose diet, and then the group of protein was reduced. Was among this most interesting to us was the PA15, which is a small scaffold protein that regulates multiple cellular function, including glucose transport, insulin secretion, cell proliferation, apoptosis, were actually increased by sucrose by uh, 56% um, compared to the control uh, diet. And then uh, the P21 and the CASB7, which is associated with uh, uh, um, apoptotic effect of the uh, cancer cells was actually downregulated by uh, the, the sucrose diet. So suggesting that sucrose might increase tumor growth by inhibiting uh, apoptosis. We then uh, did uh, further tests on the metabolism because we all know the sucrose uh, is, is very important 
um, mo molecules uh, modulating number of metabolism, including lipids uh, and, and uh, um, uh, amino acid and, and so on and so forth. So what we did, uh, we used our uh, sort of at that time was we developed a new technology uh, to uh, do to measure the untargeted as an untargeted metabolism um, metabolized to see uh, overall changing on the metabolic profile using the multi mass spectrometry. And for for that particular um, technology, we can actually look get about 100 to 120 thousand metabolites once you uh, the analysis is done, and then we cluster them to see where the they're changing or not. You can see this is a principal component analysis. Um, there's uh, um, they metabolize in the uh, um, uh, tissues from the sucrose diet group has clustered in these regions, which is very diff far from the control the the metabolite from the control the mice on control uh, diet. So suggesting there's a substantial changing on their metabolites um, after they got the uh, um, uh, in the diet with the sucrose for for certain for that long period of time, then particularly when we found changing was the called the 12 uh, heat is a 12 hydroxy eicosahexaenoic acid. Um, this is a particular um, bioactive uh, lipids that um, metabolize um, through the 12 epoxinase, and then um, we can see the uh, the 250 gram of uh, kilogram diet of the sucrose was able to increase a 2.6 fold of the 12 heat compared to the um, the cornstarch group, and we also look at the 12 logs. Um, this is an enzyme to, to to make the 12 heat in those tissues. Again, you see the 12 uh, 250 gram uh, kilogram of sucrose diet was uh, really um, increased the expression of 12 logs compared to the cornstarch. So the the 12 logs is, uh, as I said, uh, is, is one of the pathways uh, involved in the um, um, generating bioactive lipids. So um, bioactive lipids are um, a group of compounds usually derived from cyclogenase and epoxygenase, uh, as you can see here, that um, um, they use the organic acid to form uh, different um, met metabolites prostaglandins uh, through cyclooxygenase and then all the heaties through the uh, lipoxygenase. Um, and they are among the most uh, structurally diverse group of the uh, lipids um, known exist because they are a very critical component of the cell membrane and the lipid mediators involved in cell membrane function and cell singling. Um, so studies have shown dysregulation of these bioactive lipids or their pathways constituent or their, basically their metabolites is um, implicated in many digestive diseases, um, including inflammation, uh, card, inf uh, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And then uh, 12 heat, among those uh, metabolites, 12 heat is one of the lipids known to play a role in inflama inflammatory media disease, including obesity, uh, diabetes, and atherosclerosis, and cancer. In fact, there's a lot more study of the 12 heat or 12 logs in diabetes and cardiovascular disease than in cancer. But there is uh, um, quite a long study on the, on the cancer as well. So um, there's two um, isoform of the 12 logs, um, actually three, but two major ones. One is the platelet type 12 logs. In, uh, most of them actually present in human. And then there's a leukocyte type uh, 12 logs. Um, they are both human and mouse have this uh, particular um, enzyme. So the rule of the 12 logs in uh, breast cancer has been uh, documented by a number of studies. Uh, for example, um, 2006, um, there's a study by um, Muhammad actually showed elevated level 12 log expression was uh, detected in human breast cancer. And then in a similar study, they actually showed a higher level 12 logs was observed in the tumor from patient who died of uh, um, breast cancer. Additionally, um, 2011, their study by uh, uh, Sinha was uh, showing the serum 12 lux level was significantly higher in breast cancer patients with lymph node involvement. Um, furthermore, most recently, the, um, the uh, 
a paper published in JCI showed that 12 heat actually serve as a mediator of the uh, tumor, um, uh, the key mediator of, of tumor cell invasion into the lymphatic vessels and the formation of the uh, lymph node metastasis uh, to the um, in the uh, ductal membrane carcinoma. Uh, what interesting was in that study, they were using exactly the same model uh, as we have used, I'll show you later, I mean, uh, I showed you earlier, the, uh, the 41 model, MD231 model. And then finally, uh, most recently, there's a study uh, published to show they, um, the uh, peptide inhibitor of human trial locks was able to suppress memory gland tumor genesis in the uh, human MD231 MD, uh, model. So, so this basic suggesting the 12 locks, it could be very important in breast cancer, um, um, the uh, tumor genesis, breast cancer development or progression. And then we went to uh, the TCA database, uh, TCGA database, which is public genomic database, to find out whether we can see any link between the 12 locks expression and then the survival of the patient or prognosis of breast cancer patient. As you can see, this is the, um, the uh, kaplan Mark plot. You, the, the patient actually have a higher um, uh, expression of the uh, 12 locks had a significant poor prognosis and a low survival rate compared to the patient with a, a lower 12 locks expression. Um, so that was uh, quite supportive to work to, for us to continue to look into this pathway. Um, we, so what we, we did, we went ahead to look at the uh, 12 locks and, and 12 heat level in 41 mouse mammary gland tumor. As I said, there's three uh, different isoforms before. We found the increased uh, uh, level of the 12 lock protein in the 41 tumor particular, um, actually this is dose dependent, but even 250 kilogram, uh, gram per kilogram diet group. Um, compared to the control, um, control mice. And then similarly, we see about um, 1.8-fold increase on 12 heat in the tumor tissue of the uh, uh, sucrose uh, fat mice compared to the cornstarch uh, control group. Um, additionally, we also see the gene expression of 12 locks in uh, 41 mouse um, tumors were higher in the mice fed with sucrose enriched diet compared to with the control group. Um, um, also, we see um, similar findings in the, the sucrose, the fructose group and fructose plus glucose group. You can see here, both, um, both groups showed a significant increase of 12 heat levels compared to controls. Uh, in the 41 mouse model. That correlated to probably the metastasis we see, we showing earlier in this particular study which, uh, um, with the sucrose, uh, fructose, and, and uh, the both uh, fructose and glucose group. Um, similarly, we found the 12 locks also increased in the uh, MD231 um, tumor model that was fed on the, uh, the, uh, the sucrose diet. Um, and then there was about 2.2-fold increase also in the 12 heat in the group of the uh, MD231 tumor models compared to the control. Um, so now we have seen this. So what is the, how the mechanistically the glucose uh, modulate this or whether this 12 log is critical for glucose-induced tumor, in vivo tumor cell preparation and uh, um, uh, in vivo tumor genesis. So we then screened the, pa the panel of the, comp uh, the cell lines with uh, 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 treat them with the glucose in the 3D culture because the 2D, uh, we couldn't see anything. And we're not only group have the synthesis, the other group actually working on glucose have the same issue. But when we put in 3D culture, we can see um, the, um, the glucose treatment lead marked markedly higher proliferation in MDA231 and SUM149. Um, both of these are uh, triple negative cells, uh, breast cancer cells. Um, com but the other um, tumors, breast cancer cells, did not seem showing that much response. And then we also uh, checked on the, whether the glucose and fructose would uh, be able to increase uh, invasion of the MDA231 MD cells. See, um, you can see here that the fructose has much more impact in terms of invasion than the, uh, the glucose. 
So to further understand uh, whether the increased trial log experiment trial heat content are mediated by sucrose consumption in mouse model, we then examined uh, um, the effect glucose on the production of trial heat uh, in MDA231 and 41 cells. You can see here um, uh, glucose is 30 millimol even uh, treated for just uh, four hours can lead to two-fold increase in both MDA231 cells and 41 cells. And uh, um, also, the, the protein level of 12 logs was increased by glucose treatment. This is the Western plot, and this is the quantitative analysis of the several uh, Western plot we did. And so, then what the 12, can the 12 heat, then we look at the 12 heat uh, um, effect on the uh, proliferation and mi invasion migration of breast cancer cells. We did both on MD31 and 41. In MD231, you can see the 12 heat was able to inhibit, moderately um, increase the proliferation of the um, MD231 cells, and then um, also uh, quite um, lead to quite increase of the invasion in the um, uh, MD231 cells, uh, particularly the higher dose of 12 heat. Um, and then interesting enough, we see the same thing in 41 cells. And uh, at the one micromole, there was significant uh, increase in invasion of the particular, this particular cells. So then we, we thought, OK, now we know they do have some uh, biologic function. What what would happen if we can, can we block this, um, the pathway? And then we can we can see whether the effect glucose going away. So what we did first, we actually used the 12 log, selective 12 log inhibitors, which go back then. And we treat the cells with the uh, glucose alone the backland alone and the combination. As you can see here, with the glucose, there's definitely more uh, cells proliferated, and then um, backland didn't seem to change that much. But then when you see the uh, glucose uh, treated with backland together, the, the number of cells um, compared to glucose alone uh, was reduced. Um, this was a quantitative analysis showing this um, definitely when you look at the glucose and glucose treated with backland comparison, the glucose with the backland definitely has much less cell proliferation compared to the glucose alone. And then uh, to so to further understand um, by um, the 12 log rules, we actually use the uh, new uh, the CRISPR technology and suspect, successively knock down the 12 logs in the uh, in the MD231 cells, and then we look at the cell growth. The, the, the growth of cell by just knocking down 12 logs itself was already reduced the cell proliferation. But what's also quite interesting to us when we treat those cells, the scrambled cells uh, and 12 logs uh, knockdown cells with the glucose, the, the, you can see the glucose was able to increase the, um, the cell proliferation in the scramble um, MD231. But when the 12 logs knocked down, that the glucose effect was actually um, uh, Abrogated, so that was suggesting that the the, the twelve logs probably very important in glucose uh, induced uh, tumor uh, cancer cell proliferation. And then we inject the cell to the mice um, to the, um, the 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 scramble cell and twelve logs uh, uh, knockdown cell to the, uh, the the node mice, and we also we treat those group of mice with the sucrose enriched diet. This is a, a, a 125 gram per kilogram diet. As you can see in the scramble uh, mice with the scramble uh, MDA12, the MDA uh, MD231 cells has uh, about two at uh, the average of tumors around 200 milligram. But in the uh, 12 log uh, knockdown, actually only about 80. So definitely the effect was uh, blocked by the uh, the 12 log deficiency. We then. Um, so now we show there's um, the, the glucose, the glucose or sucrose fructose was, was able to increase the cancer cell, breast cancer cell proliferation, most likely through the 12 logs. So there are two questions we still don't know. First of all, is how 12 uh, glucose or fructose or sucrose could uh, increase 12 logs uh, expression um, and then uh, result in increased 12 heat. And then um, so one of them, the um, pathway that has been studied in uh, uh, diabetes and obesity was on the uh, cardiovascular disease also, was that uh, one of these um, uh, mediators called angiotensin path, which is uh, uh, the end, um, uh, related to um, 
uh, hypertension. That was showing by the uh, study that glucose actually can increase this and then increase uh, 12 lux uh, expression. So we went ahead to look at our uh, mouse tumor uh, tissue, uh, pla the, the mouse tumor model we did and take the plasma and we found the sucrose was able to significantly increase the angiotensin II in the plasma compared to cornstarch um, group. And then we also treat MBA231 cells with the glucose and then uh, look at the, 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 the media level of the angiotensin II. Again, there was a significant uh, increase in the um, uh, angiotensin II by the glucose. And so then we took, we treat the MD231 cells with angiotensin, just want to see whether 12 lox increased. Uh, as is showing here, we see the 12 lox protein was increased, and this is the quantity of analysis of the uh, of the vaccine blood. So this suggesting there's a possibility the uh, the the sugar could increase 12 lox through the angiotensin uh, upregulation by the uh, sugar. The other question we don't know is how 12 sheet actually modulate the, um, the, um, the, the breast cancer tumor uh, genesis. So what we did when we did the, as early, I alluded earlier, we did the RPPA, which is the protein omega ray analysis. During that analysis, we found one of the factor called uh, beta catenin, which is a transcriptional, uh, transcriptional regulator. Um, we found this particular um, um, factor is actually increased. Um, in the um, tumor tissues that um, from the mice fed with uh, sucrose enriched diet. And this increase was significant compared to control. And then we went to look at the 41 mouse as well that was um, um, fed with sucrose diet fructose and glucose plus fructose. We see the similar thing. There's a beta catenin seems actually elevated in those three groups. And we also treat the 12 heat MD231 cells uh, to see, um, to observe beta continuum was also increased um, in, in, the, uh, in the cells. So this gives some suggestion possible the, uh, the 12 heat, uh, 12 lox increase by, um, by uh, sugar uh, was generated, then increased the 12 heat, and maybe I should elevate the beta continuum, then finally um, cause the cell uh, and, um, proliferation increase and, and, and increase metastasis. So here, this is the current uh, our hypothesis that we think there's most likely the, the sucrose or fructose uh, was able to increase angiotensin too, um, then increase, uh, then lead to 12 lox expression increase, 12 heat um, formation increase, and then um, upregulate beta continuum, then um, cause anti-apoptotic and metastatic effect uh, in the breast cancer cells. So um, I, ha I have a um, few minutes, I want to just tackle just this last uh, objectives about uh, the, uh, the glucose effect on the therapeutic potency of breast cancer treatment. So this was actually, we well, were not really initially I want to do this. The reason we did this experiment because we were trying to identify how do we really verify the, the effect of sugar, the stimulate cell growth is because they block uh, apoptosis. So you couldn't do this in the cancer cell because they don't usually do any, they don't have a lot of apoptosis going on there in, in general situation. So what we did was uh, we treat the cells. We thought this will be able to let us answer that question, but then they, they, uh, actually uh, some new discoveries. So when we treat the cell with control and then uh, Dr. Rubinson, which is a, um, a chemotherapy agent used a lot in breast cancer patients, and then we also treat Dr. Rubinson with glucose. Okay, you can see with Dr. Rubinson, you can see uh, this is the tunnel standing, which is uh, showing uh, one of the dye used for uh, identified apoptotic, uh, uh, apoptotic uh, cell death. And you can see the cell undergo uh, apoptosis when they treat with Dr. Rubinson. Um, but there's nothing really in control. But when you treat, when you put glucose in the Dr. Rubinson treated cells, the apoptosis effect actually got uh, blocked. Um, we then went on to look at a number of the uh, two different cell lines. Um, this, both of this was showing um, was increased cell proliferation by glucose, as I, I alluded earlier. And we, used, we tested different um, um, the therapeutic, I mean, chemotherapeutic agent. 
and then to see whether glucose will block them. So majority of them was able, glucose was able to block in uh, MD231 and then ICOM49, but some of them would, did not show any um, block even though they actually showed apoptosis. And then uh, we also see some um, descriptives between, you know, among other cell lines that either they have um, induced apoptosis by doxorubicin, but there's no block. So currently we're trying to figure out what is the mechanism actually um, uh, contribute to how the, how the glucose actually block the effect of the chemotherapy agent in the breast cancer cells, particularly we were interested in the triple negative breast cancer. So with that, I would just want to summarize my uh, my talk. That basically, we uh, through our uh, three or four breast carcinoma model studies, we consistently showing the sucrose or fructose enriched diet not only shortened the onset of tumor, but also increased the proliferation of mammary gland tumor. Um, more importantly, they significantly increase the metastatic potentials of mammary uh, um, carcinoma. Um, also, we show the level 12 log proteins and, and the metabolite 12 heat in the tumor tissue from the mice actually um, was on high level of dietary sugar, was elevated, were elevated compared to the control mice. And then the production of 12 heat and expression 12 log proteins uh, from both um, cell lines that we tested um, was also increased by the uh, glucose treatment. Um, furthermore, by uh, knocking down 12 locks, we're able to, or block the, uh, using 12 locks inhibitor, we're able to block the glucose effect uh, and sucrose effect in, in the, um, the um, MDA231 cells and animal model. And beta continuum, we think possibly involving sugar glucose induced breast cancer tumor growth. And then this could be downstream mechanism 12 locks and 12 heat pathway. And finally, we also demonstrated that dietary sugar could potentially weaken the efficacy of the chemotherapy drug, which we are currently um, uh, um, continuing study. I think it's important to, to learn what the mechanism is, and that could uh, help patients who are actually under uh, active treatment eventually. So uh, with that, uh, this is I want to acknowledge people uh, in my laboratory who did study, and Dr. Lawrence Cohen was really uh, very strong support from him. Um, and then um, the support, uh, funding support from the um, uh, doctor, I mean, uh, Mr. Layden's door, uh, the private, foundation, uh, uh, private donor and the foundation um, and the University of Texas startup. Um, uh, that's basically finished my, uh, my talk. And then I want to show we are going to have the uh, um, excellent um, conference this year, uh, 2000. 16, uh, 13th International Conference in Miami, uh, the site Society of Indian Oncology, um, titled uh, The Theme Will Be Surrounded Advancing the Global Impact of Integrated Oncology. And I'm hoping uh, you'll be able to uh, join the meeting. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Peying. Um, uh, one immediate question was, um, can you return to the first page of your summary? There, OK. OK. Um, so if anybody wants to type in questions, I'll ask an in initial question. When you mention the fructose and, and you know, more fructose, I think something that comes up in clinic is whether or not fruits are good. And can you tell me a little bit, I mean, were, were these just um, mice given um, fructose through liquid, or does it make a difference? Because I think when, when uh, patients will read something like this, um, a lot of times they stop eating fruits. But we know that there are studies in breast cancer showing a high fruit diet can improve uh, prognosis and decrease recurrence risk. If you could explain that. Yeah, this is a very good question. Now, the fructose we use actually is a fructose uh, powder uh, and then blend it to the diet. So. Um, you know, this is always a good question whether fructose in the in the real fruits, which actually have different matrices around them, and then the actually isolated fructose, they have similar effect, a different effect. Um, I don't think my study could answer that question, but I want to sort of share this information with you that we uh, in the the experimental biology uh, meeting this early this year, um, the group uh, reported the fructose. Um, um, they, they, you know, in increase in prostate cancer, they have shown the fructose, um, you know, the sugar 
drinks, you know, the, even the food drinks um, was actually higher, have a higher um, incidence, increase the incidence of the prostate cancer. But there's, they didn't really, I, I actually asked the same question when they presenting about what happened at the fruits, fructose in the fruits. But to, to, to me, I think when I look at the fructose levels in the fruits, I don't think they could reach that levels that to what we demonstrate the effect. Most likely, they will, and also there's a lot of fibers or stuff, other phytonutrients in the fruits that could maybe uh, overcome the, uh, if, if the fructose is bad, the bad effect fructose. So I would, uh, you know, I was giving this talk to the, uh, to the um, prostate cancer patient at one time, and I, they say the same thing, whether they should stop fructose. I don't think, I mean, uh, fruits, eating fruits, I don't think they should do that. I don't think the fruits has high enough fructose could leave this kind of um, detrimental effect. Thank you. But Does anybody have questions? Um, very, very um, careful, I think. So if anybody has questions, um, please type them in. Um, one other question I had was that in the 12 heat um, study, it looks like the 500 grams of sucrose um, had a lower 12 heat than the 250. Is that just that at a certain point the effect was saturated and you didn't see any effect with more sugar? Well, I I, I don't I, I we this is a very good question too because for you know if we have 500 gram group and you can see even the the um, the tumor uh, onset tumor they were not actually higher and um, we we don't know yet what is the reason um, because we haven't seen. Um, whole lot other study actually compare different dose, maybe because it's saturated. You know they need a special transporters. Um, that's a possibility that could cause this problem. But that dose, I think, is it's pretty high in general. I don't think people could reach that level because the the 125 gram per kilogram was uh, consist was uh, almost. Um, equivalent to uh, 125 gram per, uh, no, the uh, 70 pound per um, sugar per pound per year, right, per person per year. So that also it gave you about 22 teaspoon per, per day. Okay, so, I have a question. Yeah, so three times you have talked about 60 teaspoon. I don't think people get that level. Okay. Um, there's a question that asks if you think the additive effect of fructose plus glucose is more important or the total fructose level? Um, sh some of the charts suggested that the highest level uh, of effect was with fructose and glucose combined. So I guess, you know, is it just the total sugar or is fructose itself the most contributing cause or is, a, is the mix between fructose and glucose more concerning? Right, so this is also a very good question because the fructose, uh, what is very interesting to learn during the study was actually uh, fructose uh, has ability to in increase absorption of glucose. So if you have glucose and fructose together, you, they, they, not only the fructose have, um, you know, the fructose would show, would do what it does, and then they also increase what glucose the absorption glucose and increase the level glucose there. So, um, to me, I, I from our data, I think we see some you know uh, modulations. These seem more. Uh, I think only um, on the, the combination group there was seems higher uh, um, than the fructose. But then the the sucrose itself, um, actually, we didn't see. The, uh, looks like the result was similar from sucrose and fructose. So. You know, there's not many uh, food or anything that could have just fructose and glucose as a single compound. But with that said, the high fructose corn syrup has both glucose and fructose. And they are all in monosaccharide form. They're not like sucrose, they're disaccharides. So that mm -hmm. could be potentially sort of mimic what we have, the fructose and, and plus glucose. Um, at this point, we haven't done more study, but it's certainly we, we are actually going to do more study to see 
if the fructose um, plus glucose together will be more impact on fructose. Um, because the other thing I want to point out, the fructose, the effect of fructose um, or metabolism actually quite different from glucose. A lot of fructose actually metabolize to the liver and then they become uh, form a lot of lipids. Um, so, so that's that's uh, but glucose is actually used by a number of organs and, and they, they produce different metabolites. So that could be, you know, the differential effect of fructose plus glucose, maybe due to they are working on different pathways. That could be more than fructose alone. So I'm just going to wrap this up pretty soon. There's a question about whether this is mostly an effect with high fructose corn syrup rather than um, something like agave nectar, which has low fructose. Um, I I I can we I guess we don't we have we don't have the answer for that yet. We what I want to say is um, we're also continue testing the different sugar type because um, some of the study we did with the sugar with the with the it's not even sugar actually sugar substitute we also see some of the effect so. I, we, I, I, it's a hard, it's a, it's, I don't have the answer yet for that question, but uh, okay. we're testing, basically. Well, Payen, let me ask one last question. Um, was there any timing effect to the glucose interrupting the doxorubicin apoptosis uh, blocking effect uh, in terms of when the glucose was given, whether it's before, or during, or after chemo? Um, we what we did so, was so one of the one of the caveats to that is steroids are given with chemotherapy, which can uh, increase blood sugar levels. I mean, do you think those things potentially also impact the effect of chemotherapy? Um, well, what we did was basically we're giving them simultaneously. You know, we didn't uh, look at yet uh, if you give um, after uh, or before. Um, but we we had a study done. We were trying to do a study in the mouse model to give them beforehand, after or afterwards. Um, but we, there was a problem with that with that model we were doing. So we we will continue the the study. We're going to um, again. We, we start another study again pretty soon to actually tackle that question. But I I think from what we have, when they actually have active chemotherapy, um, I think they should avoid that at least. During that time, particularly when the the infusion, maybe after 24 or 40 hours, they should be they can um, maybe consume maybe more than than what they they are you know just getting infusions. Well, thank you. Due to the interest of time, I'm going to wrap it up there. Uh, I'm sure that um, folks may have more questions, and you you can feel free to reach out to. Um, Dr. Young, for uh, any other follow-up questions, I think this has been really interesting, and we look forward to your uh, to your ongoing research. Thank you. Thank you.